So let's get started. So I'm hoping that um, now everyone's had a chance to implement a basic genetic algorithm. It sort of hopefully made things a little bit more concrete. I'm hoping that as your algorithms ran, you saw um, maybe some interesting phenomena. Um, so you know, seeing punctuated equilibria is something that is, um, is one kind of cool thing. I saw at least one submission where, uh, so the, the, um, you know, so the, the test function we had was something like this. Mm -hmm. And I guess like, you know, this was kind of the point we were shooting for here. And I at least saw, you know, one uh, person, uh, you know, plotted this function and then plotted the best individuals over different generations. And so what they ended up finding is that um, there were a bunch of things, spots here, and then suddenly they were up here, and then the best one ended up being this one up here. So you could see the kind of exploration there where initially they found this peak and kind of sort of exploited it, but then suddenly um, you know, someone found this peak and then they all converged over to here. Uh, one question, or one, qu or one moment, and then, um, and then if you plot the kind of like best individual over time, so this is time here, then you might find that you get, um, or maybe you just plot the best fitness over time, then you might find that you get this sort of hard line and then suddenly it jumps up to another point here. And so sometimes we refer to this as kind of a, a punctuated equilibria where you, you, know, you think you're kind of you know, stuck here, but then suddenly there's an innovation which causes you to kind of tunnel through this barrier and find this other one here. Yeah. Well, it's related to that tunneling through aspect. Mm -hmm. I was noticing that it was, especially with smaller population size, it was really dependent on that initial population because it would get sure. stuck on one of the suboptimal peaks. Mm -hmm. And I had a pretty low mutation rate, and I was wondering if you up your mutation rate, if you increase your chance of tunneling through that barrier when you have a lower initial population to then get to the big population. Uh, well, yeah, so you, there, the mutation, um, <coughs> There's this phenomenon called stochastic resonance in physics, which has to do if you have these double well potentials, um, and if you're, if you're, you know, in this case, you can think of gravity as pulling you down, and keeping you perhaps in the bottom of this well. Uh, if you've got thermal energy in the bottom of this potential well here, then it, it allows you to maintain a little bit of height here. The more and more noise, does periodically allow you to pop over this. But if you have too much noise, then you pretty much never get stuck in any well and you just hop kind of everywhere. So this, uh, this whole field of stochastic resonance is about this idea that you can have an optimal amount of noise, or if you're applying it to evolutionary systems, an optimal mutation rate, where a too little mutation and you're just stuck in these local optima, too much mutation, and you're just hopping around everywhere, and just the right amount of mutation gives you sort of the ability to kind of smooth out these barriers so you can kind of effectively uh, explore the space and settle down. We're about to get into soon, uh, maybe in another week or so, into simulated annealing, which is another nature-inspired algorithm that isn't inspired by biology, but in that case, we've already heard some people ask questions about this annealing schedule. And you can imagine mutation rates, and I've already kind of talked about non-uniform mutation, where you can take your mutation rate starting big and then over time make it smaller. And the idea behind that is that there is some sort of optimal mutation rate, but you don't know it. And so you set it large just to kind of allow yourself to move across the whole space. But then, it's, so it's, like it's kind of you know, hot and then in this plasma state, and gradually things coalesce. And hopefully, if they're constantly bouncing around, they'll coalesce in a good spot, and then they'll cool down to the point where they end up getting stuck in only that good spot. So this idea behind simulated annealing can also be applied here in this adaptive mutation rate. And another, you can think of it as a kind of a hyper-optimization, where I don't know the hyperparameter of the mutation rate, and so I'm going to search over the hyperparameters as I'm also searching over the parameters here. So that's one way to kind of do that. But I'm hoping at least that that exercise of doing that genetic algorithm uh, made, um, again, things more concrete uh, in some, some of the kind of more theoretical stuff that we've been doing. And so, you know, genetic algorithms have evolved themselves quite a bit over time. Um, so initially, genetic algorithms were, um, and we're going to kind of talk about today how they've been further extended. Initially, when GAs came out, we thought of GAs as being 
um, these things that were um, you know, integer only encodings. And so, and usually those were binary strings. So the, on Canvas, when you go to view the, the icon that is associated with this course, I've picked one that kind of shows a binary encoded genotype and another binary encoded genotype doing crossover. And you can see they swap their zeros and ones. And so uh, I'll mention it here in a, in a second here that, that back when the GAs came out, there was a competing framework that you don't hear about so much anymore um, called Evolution Strategies, ES. And there's some slight differences between um, E, G, A, and E, S. But when they first came out, E, S was sort of um, the way to do things if you wanted a continuous valued genotype or genes that were continuous valued. And then G, A's were meant out there to be sort of integer. This is kind of like, uh, you know, borrowing an example, and maybe it's a little too ancient for some in the class, but like VHS versus uh, Betamax. So you can, or, or token ring versus uh, Ethernet or something like that, is that these were just like alternative ways to approach these optimization algorithms where um, this is, I'd say, the continuous valued genes. And since then, the benefit, there's been crossover between these two. So now, if you go into pretty much any GA that's been pre-implemented for you by MathWorks or whoever, uh, Wolfram, um, then they probably use or give you the ability to use continuous valued genes. So they're basically taking insights from evolution strategies, which again I'll talk about here in just a second, um, and have inserted them into GAs. But the basic structure of the GA has been is, is kept there. And there are other variations of the GAs. And so what I, I'm hoping that you'll take out from this last you know uh, week and a half, two weeks that we've been talking about the GAs is that if you go into a Python API or MATLAB and you look up how they implement the GA, then you'll be able to use these insights to sort of take, well, all right, I basically know what crossover mutation are. How do they implement crossover mutation? And how do I kind of insert my knowledge into, into this? So as an example, if you were to go into MATLAB, so that's just picking a tool that I'm assuming a large number of you have used, uh, that uh, doesn't require a great deal of maybe programming background, um, and, uh, and, and a lot's already been done for you. And so if you were to go into MATLAB and just type um, help GA, if you have the genetic uh, optimization toolbox, you'd find a very simple operation that will spit out there that by, that if you just accept all the default parameters, you end up getting something which takes a function handle or function name and a number of variables that, um, that is basically the number of arguments of that function, and it'll go and do an optimization. That's it. So you could put in the function from the homework in as the first argument, and the number of uh, var uh, variables you could put in as one, and it would go out and it would come up with whatever that answer was, 0.8 or something like that. And behind the scenes, it would be doing a GA. Now, it has a bunch of these extra options here that affect, um, you know, allow you to add linear and nonlinear constraints, and also allow you to adjust things like the selection operator, the mutation operator, um, and crossover. And so you can, uh, it gives you a bunch of selection operators already pre-implemented, um, including the ones we talked about. It gives you a bunch of crossover operators already implemented, and a bunch of mutation operators already implemented, and it gives you the prototypes for those three types of functions so you can write your own. And, but it, the, the MATLAB GA is a little bit different um, in the way that they've implemented selection, mutation, and crossover. So I'll just point that out just to show you a variation that you see in commercially implemented GAs. And so um, if you were to go and do a doc GA in MATLAB um, and uh, then drill down through all of that documentation uh, then you'd end up finding uh, a basic flowchart, uh, at least maybe in words, that goes something like this. So it has a it has a create initial population, and uh, so that's the same. Uh, and then it scores. So then the, the 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 terminology here is a little bit unfortunate, but um, it scores that population by the fitness function. Now fitness, they're calling your optimization objective a fitness function. And um, 
that for convention, without loss of any generality, it scores in terms of minimization. And so we're minimizing a fitness function. So it's a little bit weird, like why would I be minimizing fitness? Um, and then on top of that, uh, because they recognize that, um, that fitness, you might need some other surrogate before you do your selection operator, the second thing that they do is scale fitness um, to more useful so-called expectation values. And so when I presented this, I called this the optimization objective and this the fitness function. But they are calling this the fitness function and this the expectation. Um, and so I, I generally have never really liked this terminology because expectation sounds kind of stochastic or something. Or, and then, you know, fitness, it, well, it doesn't really seem like fitness, but I think it's because they recognize that everybody associates fitness with GAs and everybody sort of in their head thinks of the optimization objective being related to fitness just for the purpose of making all the documentation work, they decided, well, we need to create a semantics where the optimization objective is the fitness function. So that's a slight variation. I underline scale fitness because you, uh, it has a default way that it scales fitness, but you can pass in your own function to do your own fitness scaling here as you'd like. And if you say why, um, then MATLAB will tell you it's all about maintaining diversity. And I'm hoping in the last two weeks or so, you now have an, sort of an appreciation that maintaining diversity is a way of maintaining exploration. And if you go into the MATLAB docs, you'll find that they even have uh, their own pre-cooked examples of optimization uh, objectives that have multiple local optima, and they show that when you make choices for fitness scaling that promote diversity, you're more likely to find the global optima, and if you do uh, reduce diversity, you're less likely to find it, although you will find an optima. So that's already sort of in there. I didn't make all that stuff up. Um, and then you take and you place and I'm going to use E um, as a variable here. You get to choose what this number is, E, um, of the highest expectation values, or I, I would say expectation values or individuals with the highest expectation values into the next generation. And this um, E, which is user definable, is your um, number of elites. So this is your elite parameter. It just copies these directly into the next generation. And the size of the generation is one of the things that you can also set. So that's another user definable thing. And then from there, um, you have M minus E spots left. And so this is where it diverges a little bit. We didn't have elites in the genetic algorithm I showed you, but the R parents sort of had a similar feeling as elites because they almost were, they were copied kind of identically and they normally were then gonna be the highest in fitness. And that's the reason why you, if you were just plotting the best fitness over time in your own genetic algorithm, you found that that sort of was monotonic. Because uh, you know, that it, was, it would be very, very rare for, for an individual that was doing well in one population to not be selected into the next population. So we already kind of had elites, even though we didn't formally call them elites. MATLAB formally has an elites. And then at this point, we would do crossover. We would do selection, crossover, and mutation as a sequence. MATLAB does it a little bit different. It takes these M minus E other sl uh, slots, and it divides the parents up. So it, by parents, I mean it selects from the population enough parents to fill this M minus E spots. And what I mean by that is it, it, is it selects high ranking parents and then it divides them up into the parents that will participate in crossover and the parents that will participate in mutation. And so parents that participate in crossover don't have any mutation, they just produce uh, recombined offspring into those M minus E and parents that do mutation don't do any crossover. You just take the parent and you mutate them and then you put those into the next generation. Likewise, when they do crossover, by default, they just randomly choose a crossover point. Uh, you can define your own crossover operator where you fix that like you did in the homework, 
but they just randomly choose a crossover point in every crossover and then do that crossover. So you set a so-called crossover fraction and then one minus the crossover fraction goes to mutation. So the one minus crossover fraction of these m minus c spots, so, uh, so I'll say of m minus e spots, go and mutate. And then the other ones go and through crossover. And then the crossover fraction the mutation operator and the crossover operator are all user definable. So you can, by default, I think it's 80%. So 80% go over here and there's a default crossover operator and you can define your own crossover operator. And the way these operators work is they take a certain number of parents in and whatever number of parents in, you have to produce that many offspring. So when you define the crossover fraction, MATLAB says I have n minus e spots left. So I'm gonna cut my parents up so that I've got the ones I want, the offspring I want from crossover, they'll get passed to this function. The offspring I want for mutation get passed to this function. And these functions look at how many parents they have and they produce the right number of offspring. And then that produces a certain number of offspring for both of those that get put back together and that's that. Yes? Do you have more parents to divide parents? To divide parents this way as opposed to passing all the parents? Well, I think the reason that MATLAB does it this way is, is they don't want you to do a bunch of extra mutation or crossover that you don't need to do. So if I passed, if I had 100 parents, and I passed all 100 here and all 100 here, if I ended up only needing like five offspring for mutation, I would mutate all of them, and then MATLAB would have to prune that down. So that means I have 95 parents that I mutate in every gene, and I just throw that stuff away. So it's easier for them, and they can do this all in memory too. So they can just sort of say, the front end of the array goes here, the back end of the array goes here, and there's no copying or anything that has to be done. Does yeah. this take care of the mutation programming thing, the crossover programming thing? Um, well, that is set by default here, and you, you, can, you can update, you can change that yourself. And so the default mutation functions, you, they have options you can pass in or you can write your own mutation function, and it has the kind of prototype that you have to fill in, but it basically, again, takes a vector of parents, and you produce a vector of uh, offspring, and you can you know, do it however you like. And so those end up being, uh, so MATLAB depicts these as it's got elites, which kind of are copied directly in, it's got um, this crossover, operator that produces these half and halves. And then it's got this mutation, which produces a slightly variable one. And you are defining what proportion go into these three groups. And that's your new population, is some fraction that are directly copied, some fraction that are crossed over, and some fraction that are mutated. And all of those um, you end up asking all right, have we met our termination condition? And um, if not, you go back up with the new population, you do it all over again, and if uh, otherwise, you can end. And, um, and then on top of that, you can actually, if you wanted to do things like plot the fitness over time, you can pass in the MATLAB's GA function and output function, and every generation, it will spit out is a current progress, so you can plot these things exactly like you did in the homework. So you could, I could have made it, I'm not gonna do this, but I could have made it you know, a follow-up homework where I'd say, all right, redo the, um, both of the, the problems in the proof of the first homework using a pre-implemented genetic algorithm like MATLAB, and you could, my claim is, go into MATLAB, and um, even though there's slight differences in the way they're defining when crossover mutation happened, basically redo both question one and question two of the homework using MATLAB instead. So my, my, my point here is that the GA that I taught you isn't necessarily the GA that you'll see in every commercial package, but my hope is if you understand the basic ideas behind crossover, mutation, and selection, that you'll be able to drop into any GA API and be able to insert your own parameters here. And I hope you'll see that 
Sometimes you really have to because the defaults, they might work for some functions, but for other functions, you really need to you know, maximize diversity. Or um, maybe for other functions, you need to get rid of crossover and so on and so forth. So this is how things are done kind of on the commercial scale. Pre-implemented for you with a bunch of, uh, basically a bunch of levers that you can move around. Yeah. You talked about like optimizing your hyperparameters and stuff, mm -hmm. and adding in another layer of it. Right. Could that be done to like a, a DOE type deal? Yeah, I mean, you could view this as an experiment, and your hyperparameters are kind of, uh, you know, cramp that, yeah, so you have no idea how the GA works, so you view it as an experiment, and now you need to optimize over that experiment, that's fine, you can do it that way. You can think of the GA as doing a DOE for you, you know, that's another way to view it. And I also should mention that in MATLAB's GA toolbox, there is a hybrid function. So I mentioned that you can, you can combine optimization algorithms, like a gradient algorithm and, um, and one of these. And it automatically allows you to drop that in too. So it basically gives you a function handle where once you get within you know, some uh, level of convergence, it hands things off to another algorithm and it takes over from there. So hopefully that smooths things out and finds a, it does a local search so that this is almost like a course search, then the local search kind of makes it smoother and more guaranteed as you get to the top. So that's all pre implemented so that's what you get if you were going to, you know, if you didn't like it, like if you went to uh, Python, I'm pretty sure, I think there's a Python GA API that you can use as well. Um, there's a bunch of GAs that are built into statistical tools and other things like that, the drop down menus. Even MATLAB has a graphical front end for the GA. So all this stuff has been built for you. Uh, as long as you know these basic terms, selection, thickness scale, um, crossover mutation, you're ready to go. So any questions about, about any of that stuff? Before we move on to generalizing. All right, so I mentioned that, um, that once upon a time there was the battle of GA versus ES, where ES were these evolution strategies. And I don't want to talk a lot about these evolution strategies, but I do want to um, mention them briefly. Um, just because, again, when you look at the history of evolutionary computing, you see elements of the GA pop up. Like last time, I showed these artificial immune systems. Our artificial immune system, my claim was that um, every, for every antigen in the positive selection uh, one, it, in that case, or the clonal selection, it was really just two generations of an evolutionary algorithm or a genetic algorithm with no crossover. And, um, and so back then I said, so it was really, you know, you could tell, you could see how the GA, uh, even though they were inspired by the way the acquired immune system is able to find uh, these antibodies that can match up to these antigens, the way it's been implemented was really more like a GA. Now, if, to be truthful, they probably were more inspired by evolutionary strategies. And so evolutionary strategies, this was uh, originally came out of Germany. So the GAs, uh, there was a guy named Holland who was working with the GAs um, here in the States. And then in Germany, they were working with evolution strategies and these are happening like in parallel with each other. And it was just a sort of a different approach. And so the initial version of an evolution strategy wasn't even a population-based approach. And so uh, these evolution strategies are normally uh, abbreviated with a tuple um, where You've got like M over rho comma L, and the original ones were one comma one, where what these represent is M is um, basically the uh, number of parents, rho, uh, or so it's like a, a mixing parameter, is the number of parents, so it has to be less than M, um, participating in recombination, which we all know about now, and L is the number of offspring. And so in an evolution strategy, strategy the original versions, which uh, were either one comma one or some people wrote them as one plus one, uh, you basically had, this was just a kind of a, a local direct search. You have one individual stand somewhere in the, in the search space, and it gets mutated, and so it moves a little bit, 
So usually you'd add a little Gaussian, zero mean Gaussian noise to it. And, um, and then that result would be one offspring. And so one individual takes one step and then that mutated version is the one offspring. So this was sort of a, a way to, you can think of this as generalizing a stochastic search, just a local search. And as things got um, more, and then so if that one offspring was better than the parent, then the offspring would take over. If the parent was continued to better, then it would, the parent would still take, would, would do it all over again. And so this was a way to sort of, they thought of it as an evolution strategy because parent and offspring were kind of competing with each other for that one spot in the population. So you could grow those parameters and uh, so we, you know, this could now become uh, you know, a five comma five or five comma 15 or something along those lines or um, they define recombination and, and people talk about, well, can I have multiple parents more than two participating in recombination and they allowed for that in evolution strategies as well. So you could have you know, 10 parents and five of them are selected to create the offspring. And so that was, um, so that was kind of uh, an alternative approach. But like I said, the big reason why people used ES over GA is that ES naturally allowed for these continuously variable genes and that's where they were just adding Brownian noise to them. But then once GAs picked up continuous valued genes, then GAs could do a lot of this same stuff already. And so you kind of didn't, you don't see evolution strategies so much anymore, unless you're in kind of niche academic uh, circles where there's still a culture of this stuff for historical reasons. But largely like, you know, you don't go into MATLAB and find an evolution strategy implemented, or if you do, it's, it's not really as well maintained as the GA one. You know, for whatever reason, even if this might have been the Betamax and had better picture or whatever, uh, the GA kind of became the VHS of the genetic algorithm or of the evolutionary algorithms, and it kind of took over. But you should at least know that this ES exists. That there's this other history of genetic algorithms and a whole lot of really cool people and good work in evolution strategies. And so, if you're interested in evolutionary computing, I definitely recommend you take a look at ES just to sort of see how that community evolved over time. But, um, but otherwise, if you're just kind of using these as a commodity, you probably don't have to worry about these, but I at least wanted to bring them up. Now, the other um, big area that kind of sprung forth from these evolutionary approaches was evolutionary programming. And that's what I wanted to talk about today. And so, evolutionary programming, of which a subset or a more derived set is genetic programming, which I'll get to in a second, but we're going to start with just some pure old evolutionary programming, which I'll call EP. This is very similar to GAs, but we, we don't have the same uh, representation of the genome, and there's no crossover. Um, here, basically what evolutionary programming is trying to do is to automatically develop code that has certain features that, you know, maybe this is um, code to solve a particular problem. Maybe it's code to solve a particular problem using a certain, you know, under certain constraints. And so um, the idea here is that initially they said, well, how do we evolve code over time? What is the right encoding for code? Now, to, uh, to a, you know, regardless of how you write a computer program, you can always think of every computer program as a finite state machine. And so evolutionary programming was all based on finite state machines. This idea that, um, you know, if I have a you know, state A, and I'll put um, this convention, I'll use double circles to maybe mean I start in state A, and I have some input that on receiving it while in state A, takes me to state B, and then I have um, additional inputs that might keep me in state B, or inputs that take me back to state A, and then I've got inputs that keep me in state A. So basically there are two types of finite state machines that we worry about. Does anybody remember the two basic categories of finite state machine by computer scientists? Or 
I'm uh, looking for something maybe more of my electrical engineering sort of. Uh, um, that's true. Is it? So, um, uh, so, so it is true that you have deterministic and non-deterministic. Let's focus on deterministic. Of the deterministic, like I'm building a circuit, then uh, there, there's two sort of types of state machines that I design when I'm building a hardware circuit. And those are Mealy and Moore machines. Does that ring any bells? Yeah, so, <laughs> there you go. So there's. So Mealy and Moore machines, and basically the difference here is that in a, um, in these are almost like output types. So in a, in a Moore type output, you associate outputs with the states. So you produce an output when you're in a particular state, and then you transition to another state, and you might produce a different output. In a Mealy machine, you produce an output based on the state you were in and the input. And so we label Mealy machines with outputs on the transitions. We label more machines with outputs on the states themselves. And, um, and so uh, from a, an implementation point of view, Mealy machines sometimes, back when we cared about the hardware a little bit more than we do today, the Mealy machines could actually make for tighter implementations because they would have outputs that could change with fewer memory elements. So they were maybe a little faster by hair and you didn't need as many things keeping track of memory because now your output could kind of couple in whatever the input was coming in. You didn't have to actually switch to a new state. So you could have one state with lots of different transitions and each transition would have a different output but you'd only be in one state. So, um, so these two different types here, but the big thing that was in common between these, all these is you have a certain number of states, you've got labels on the edges, and you've got labels for outputs. And either those labels for outputs happen in the states or on the lines here. And the thought here is that you can, in, and every single computer program can be written as a finite state machine. So every computer program has a certain number of states. It might be a large number of states, and it's transitioning from one state to another based on inputs, and it's producing outputs. So every single computer program could, in principle, be encoded as a finite state machine. And so in evolutionary programming, the thought was, what if we encode a finite state machine as a genotype? Then we can maybe then automatically create these programs using operations like mutation and selection. The thing is, they couldn't quite figure out how to get crossover to work, so there was no crossover in evolutionary programming. So the, the thought would be that you could, for example, um, when you want to mutate, so under evolutionary programming, the, for each parent, so EP generates a population of finite state machines. And for each parent, we've got a mutation. And that mutation might do things like, um, let's change an output signal. So change symbol on output. So before, whenever we were in state B, we outputted a one. But now we're in state B, we're in output a two. Um, it might be it adds a state transition. So we've got a bunch of states. We're just going to pick two states and draw a transition between them. Um, so we could, you know, so add a transition. Or maybe you want to add a whole new state. Or delete a state and all of the transitions going to it or change the initial state. And so the resulting offspring will be a similar finite state machine, and the best performing finite state machines will make it into the next population. So this was one way, they, so it was a way in which you could get kind of computers writing code is by effectively operating on graphs, where those graphs were encoding programs. Now you can take a graph like this one, and then once it's in this form, you can then, with this, there's a pretty easy canonical way to turn anything I draw like this into a piece of computer code. But um, it's a little harder to go the other way around, but if you have it in this, you can definitely write the computer code. Yes, question? In the back. Um, 
Well, they, they do. The states are the memory. So in a finite state machine, when I'm in this state, I, you know, if I switch to the other state, like which state I'm in is like this is state zero, that's state one, and this together is storing one bit of information. I get that, but then, uh, so this is the same problem as automated testing, right? Like if you have a lot of these, like if you have a very complicated finite state machine which has a lot of states, right? You can't explore the whole state machine, meaning you can't figure inputs that can exactly explore the entire state machine. Because that's the same problem you face with software security, where when you have a program, you can't exactly determine the inputs that can, for example, trigger a puzzle in between or an exploit in the program. So meaning to say that, how do you exactly trigger fitness in a situation like this where you can't explore every state possible? Well, the, the idea here is, is, so fitness is often going to be the term, like let's say, uh, before neural networks were as popular, you wanted to generate a program that for any given input would produce an output that would be most consistent with a training set. You could de you develop, uh, like a, you know, use the same loss functions you use for neural networks, but use them to penalize finite state machines. So you, we're basically saying, can I find a finite state machine encoding of an input-output map where I've got data that's from my inputs and I've got um, you know, outputs that, I'm that I've seen, and I would like to have this reconstruct. You know, if I give you the same input sequence, it will give me that output sequence. And whenever it varies from that output sequence, we can penalize that. So that's one way to think of this as an alternative form of training a neural network, where instead of using a neural network as the back end, you're using a finite state machine. Um, you, there's other ways you can penalize. So it, I may not be penalizing how many states I'm using or anything like that, but I'm, I'm usually the, the fitness is focused on these inputs or these outputs. Maybe they're focused on structural properties, like how much memory do I use, but usually they'll be focused on something more functional. Uh, for example, let's say I'm building an algorithm that runs on a robot, uh, you know, and this might be that I'm in drive state or I'm in turn my vacuum on state. And I would like to build uh, a, a, a state machine that is most likely to collect all of the balls on a floor. And so how do I evolve a program that can switch between drive and vacuum state based on the balls that it encounters or doesn't encounter? Maybe there's a timer that has to go off as well that most efficiently cleans the floor. So this would be one way to design that if you didn't, you know, you could come up with a, you know, okay, I'll just move in a lawnmower pattern. Whenever I hit a ball, then I'll vacuum that up. But who says that's best? So maybe it's faster to move in a random direction, and, and this would be a way to find that. So fitness here is uh, it's very abstract and very general. It's not necessarily based on the, the state machine so much as what the state machine is doing. Other questions? Yeah. Well, this is, you still fit this all within that genetic algorithm, but with no crossover. But now you're encoding in your genotype um, all of the aspects, like, you know, the, the, um, the, the, number of, the number of states, what the labels are in the states, the number of edges, all of these things. Like, you can imagine that that genotype actually is going to change its size over time. So you can scalarize this graph representation into a long string which just encodes how many states you have, how many edges you have, where all the labels are, and that becomes the genotype. We don't do any crossover because some individuals will have very small strings and some individuals will have very large strings, so it's hard to figure out how to crossover. But you keep rid of crossover, and mutation just means growing and shrinking that string representation. But every string representation could be decoded into a finite state machine, which could then be implemented in code, in programming code. Uh, yeah. So basically mutation. Basically only mutation is happening and what we are doing is if we are trying to mutate, uh, we could be reducing the number of edges or putting in some more states or increasing the number of output states, decreasing them. That's right, that's right. Yeah, all of these are all the things you could do on a mutation. Yeah. Uh, in the back. 
Yeah, I mean, so, uh, I mean, there's lots of examples of, uh, so again, this is old. So this was like the original, you know, so when I get into genetic programming, it was more modern. But the closest thing to this that I might recommend if you're interested in is a framework called um, Automode. And I'm going to forget what letters are capitalized and what letters aren't. But there's a, um, a European group that uh, uses these as an alternative to, so there's a bunch of evolutionary robotics, for example. That's why I brought that example up because I was actually thinking of these folks. And in evolutionary robotics, you have a very, uh, the typical way people do evolutionary robotics is I have a neural network and I, it just maps inputs to outputs and I've got a huge number of weights and I'm gonna run some evolutionary algorithm on those weights and that'll hopefully give me a nice mapping from input to output. Now, these folks say that is way too fine grain and you need to coarsen the amount of behaviors that the robot can do. Uh, and so they say, what if instead we have a number of different subroutines that uh, are basically like states in here, and we want to then uh, wire up these subroutines so that and maybe then you'll actually get more generalizable robots. Because the problem with the typical evolution of robotics is a so-called reality gap where if you evolve a robot in sim, once you implement in reality, you find out that there's some aspect of the sim that is critical for the function. So it might just be that it was following the wall, but it really needed the wall to behave a certain way. And once you put it in reality, when it's not a perfect line, it's kind of a bumpy line, then the robot gets very confused. It was taking, it really needed this to be a, you know, a straight, same thing in data science, where you do a bunch of, um, a bunch of things to your inputs to keep the neural network from specializing and overfitting. So you have the same problem in evolution robotics, you can overfit to the simulator. So their thought, the automode guys uh, and gals, uh, the thought was that they said, well, let's to improve generality, let's reduce the size of the search space by forcing their certain behaviors like drive straight, turn left, turn right, um, you know, move randomly. And then we don't know how to wire these things up but we're going to use an approach that actually looks very similar to old-fashioned evolutionary programming to wire these things up, uh, reward some, penalize others, and end up finding the optimal thing to do certain things, like work as a team to excavate, or find all the balls in a room, or whatever. And so that would be one example I guess I'd encourage to look at is, uh, is there's actually a lot of literature on that. Yeah. Did you say that you, yeah, well, you, you, you first and then me. Like you said, there, uh, there is a notion of fitness over here. So well, there is a notion of fitness, but it's not necessarily based, uh, it's not like a mathematical combination of these things. It, it, fitness is realized in you implement the code and you give it a set of inputs, and then you measure fitness based on the outputs that are produced, similar to training a neural network, for example. So is it like some kind of a reward function and then you get some value out of it, like passing the input through check if it has been able to achieve its goal. Right, I mean, all, all of these evolutionary algorithms can be viewed through the lens of reinforcement learning. And so the fitness function provides a feedback on which you change these populations over time in a kind of a reinforcement learning type of way, for sure. Yeah. Hey, just have you heard of any of these being applied to the autonomous vehicle issue? Which autonomous vehicle? Oh, you mean like, like, like urban vehicles? Yeah. Well, so, I mean, certainly in laboratories, they're using these evolutionary methods to investigate, you know, certain aspects of those problems. But uh, when things actually, when the rubber hits the road, so to speak, the, the, uh, I think that um, you have these reliability and, you know, guarantees. For example, um, it, you know, friends of mine who work on evolutionary robotics for space travel have had a hard time getting, uh, robots on Mars, for example, that have been designed this way because it's hard to, to give the same guarantees that NASA wants. Now, and I also think that in the urban driving scenario, the, um, the, the driving is oftentimes less interesting from a programming perspective as things like the computer vision. And, and, and those sorts of things I think you could. In fact, things like those of you who know about like particle filtering, for example, things like that, those really are heuristic approaches that are actually not that much different than these, and you don't quite have to worry about the, 
the guarantees, like when you're purely living in signal processing world, then people tolerate error more than like if you're like, how many pedestrians do you run over? <laughs> so, you know, so how many pedestrians do you misclassify is somehow less worse or less bad than how many pedestrians do you actually run over? Question or comment? Right. Well, that's true. That's true. And, the, the, and actually, the thought that's actually one of the arguments that these folks make as well versus a neural network is that these state machines, and especially if you also limit like how the, some complexity, you put a constraint on the complexity of the state machine, are easier to understand than the neural networks. There's also another framework that's meant to be a competitor to neural networks called Markov brains. And Markov brains are also meant to provide the same richness as neural networks, but hopefully uh, provide a maybe a little bit more interpretability, but still most Markov brain applications are so large that it's really hard to interpret, but at least it's easier to interpret than like a neural network. So that is you know, another approach here. But just trying to get background in, in this general evolutionary program before we move on to the genetic program. So but this, is this basic framework makes sense, is that you're, you're evolving finite state machines. You're basically evolving graphs, um, and you're um, rewarding and penalizing those graphs and how well they behave in a kind of programming context. All right. So um, evolutionary program was great for a while. You know, people worked with this sort of stuff. And then they realized that, um, you know, there might actually be better representation strategies that would allow for us to do to inherit more from evolutionary algorithms than just this kind of mutation level stuff. Here's like, you know, how could we, for example, make use of crossover? We know that crossover is a useful operator, so how could we possibly do crossover here? Um, now, there were uh, some attempts at coming up with ways of encoding programs like, for example, if you encode an entire program as a string of operations where, you know, they're kind of like these, um, uh, the, these, these one operation, uh, the, the, there's, a, um, there's a, an acronym for this, but, uh, but where, if you, it would, where you basically can, you've got every single operation, like you've got no blocks of code, you compress everything into one statement. So, um, in these cases, there's never a worry that if you do crossover, you're going to break a large structure. And so these atomized programs exist. And, and again, for the computer architecture people, there's um, one operation, single operation, uh, micro, you know, so, um, anybody help me here from the, so in the computer architecture, back when computer architecture was more stressed, like back, back in my days, um, this was like a big thing is that you had, the, the, you would often be, sort of given these architectures where you would um, you could do everything like the one operation allowed you to like branch if negative uh, you know it's like multiply and branch if negative or something like that and if you have it's like the NAND gate of computer architecture but not a NAND gate but it's like the, the idea that if you you in this one operation you could actually do everything and so uh, there was you didn't have to worry about uh, everything was atomized, so that if you had a list of routines, you could just swap one list with another, very much like a genotype, and you would still get a functional program, at least syntactically functional. Like, you wouldn't break any syntax checks. You might break the function of the program, but you wouldn't get like just an immediately infeasible program. <coughs> but those are kind of tedious, and so instead, they said, you know what, um, from the, the, the compiler folks, we're putting everything into these parse trees. And if we really think about code as a, as, a, as a tree, these trees have a natural structure that actually makes them work really well for genetic programming. So this genetic programming, well, maybe I'll put this on the new page here. So genetic, the dawn of genetic programming was the realization that we can take an abstract syntax tree as our genotype. So I'll show you what I mean by that. 
So as a simple example, let's say I wanted to do five times two. I can encode that as a tree. And that tree would have multiplication, and then it would have these operators down here. And maybe I just, oh, I could put, instead of arrows, maybe I'll just link them like this. And so I know that whenever I have multiplication, like I, I maintain type here, I know that the only thing that can fit here is something that returns a number. And I know that this thing returns a number. So if I wanted to further expand on that, if I wanted to say, okay, well, uh, let's say instead of putting a five there, I could actually take another multiplication operation. <clears throat> and then now I've represented two times three times two. And so because I've got the, the notion of type, it allows me to take other trees and put them in to the spots where they match up kind of like Legos. And, uh, and I can, so you can kind of see that this is opening the, you know, the possibility space to allow us to do something like recombination. Because you can imagine coming up with ways to cut these things up and so long as you cut two trees so that you've got the right types on the sides of these cuts, you can then swap things from one tree to another. And then mutations and things like that can end up being like, well, adding new edges and so on and so forth. So, but like if I wanted to mutate this five, I can, like this could have just as easily, instead of being viewed as a crossover, be viewed as a mutation. I can say, I want to have all of the possible things that can return a number, well, one of them is multiplication. But in order for you to have multiplication, I need some arguments there. So I'm going to draw some random arguments. So now I've got close my tree out, and so now I can put that in there. And how does this apply to, you know, to things that look more like code? Well, if I had something like while i is greater than 5, um, you know, i equals i plus 1, i minus 1, In, then I can think of this similarly as a syntax tree where I've got the predicate on one side and then I've maybe got an assigned statement that's hidden on the other <coughs> side here and that assigned statement assigns I the value of minus I and so I've now represented this code as a tree and each node has a type and as long as I maintain the types then it doesn't matter what's you know what's beyond that so this allows me to perform mutations just so long as I mutate within the right types and this allows me to perform crossovers because I can now um, you know, make arbitrary cuts through these things just so long as I maintain the, the right um, you know, type, then I can swap in subtrees that fit. So this, so I still need to scalarize this into a genotype, but that's something that is, uh, is a doable problem. Uh, yeah, first question. So then the subtrees are a function of your offspring. Uh, well, this is like a parent, and the offspring would be the new program where I might have swapped in a different predicate. Yeah, got you. Yeah, question in the back. Um, so, I guess as a, like, comment, so when, 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 you were, when you were drawing that tree right there, all I could, all I could think of was this. Sure. So, right. Absolutely. So um, I, I think you'll find that people who work in genetic programming are going to be more biased towards languages that are sort of naturally in tree form. And so Lisp uh, or you know like Scala or whatever else you like, like JS expressions, um, things that uh, functional programming languages that sort of already feel this way are more natural to do this way. And it's really nice about something like Lisp 
is that programming language, like everything is like a first order citizen. And so it's easy to just toss these functions around. Um, and so whereas anonymous functions in C become a little like uglier. And so you can imagine writing a language that's evolving a C program, but you can't imagine a C program kind of evolving itself very easily. But in Lisp, you could imagine the program is easily evolving itself because it's able to kind of eat itself up in this same sort of way. So absolutely, I think that if you go into this, like I, I kind of present this because this I think is more familiar to a, a broader audience, but the people who are really deep in this stuff, that's the natural way to go. Uh, I think, uh, I'll go to take the uh, How to go to important, I mean, we have one i equals plus five, and that i is equal to i plus minus one. So, I mean, we are doing this piece, there's no order. So this messes things up for the... Well, I, so it's kind of like, uh, the in order for us to do the while, we have to do these two things. And so what the syntax tree is saying is that this branch and this branch are independent from each other. So the, the ordering we don't know about, we just know that we need to do both of these before we can do this. Okay. But I mean, but I mean I is written apply with the condition, and I is the, they are two different things. That, that's right. So you, you would normally set the kind of, when you set these trees up, um, I mean, I'm not showing kind of like how all these Legos plug into each other, but the idea would be is that this would be, all, the left one would always be the condition, and the right one would always be the block. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, in the back? Yeah, there we go. Uh, yeah. What do, you, what do you mean by maintain the type? Like, if you say we can, we can do a bunch of operations, like truncation and things like that, mm -hmm. as long as it maintains the type. Right. Now, what, what do you mean by that? So the thought would be that if, let's say I've got two parents, and there are these abstract trees here. And so who knows what they look like, but this is just an arbitrary. So I've got these parents here. And so the thought was that if I were to draw a random subtree, um, I might draw another. So I've got these two parents and these two different subtrees. Now, if this if I'm, I focus on this node here at the root of the tree here, I need those two things to be the same kind of thing. So if that's a while, for example, then this can't be um, you know, something else. Like if, or if this is a multiplication, then maybe this uh, over here needs to also be an operator, like a you know, an addition <laughs> or uh, it can't be a while loop. But if that's a while loop, and that's a for loop, then maybe they're compatible. So I can, if I've got these two parent trees, if I'm able to select subtrees that match at their root in type, then I can do a crossover. And I can take whatever program was running here and now swap out this uh, set of code and swap in this set of code. And so that's how we implement crossover in terms of trees. Well, it's very, it's very general purpose. I mean, so this is supposed to be a way to automate writing code. And so why do you write code? Somebody comes to you and says, I need you to write me um, a piece of program that allows me to, to more quickly calculate a formula. And so you say, well, I can, there's a bunch of different ways I could write that formula, and I'm going to choose one, but maybe it's more efficient for me to write it a different way. So you might not know, like, like you could say, all right, well, I, um, the, I think the fastest way, I don't have a proof, but I think that the way I've written this code, this is the fastest way for me to calculate this formula. Maybe this formula does have a closed form expression. It involves a bunch of loops and other things like that. And this one takes one minute in order to execute. But I could then say, well, as long as I'm going to now set up an evolutionary uh, loop here, and I'm going to make it so that it, it must give me the, right, the same input output mapping as my formula. So I maybe pre-calculated a bunch of inputs and outputs. But I am going to make the fitness 
the time it takes for it to do each one of the calculations. And maybe, just maybe, by doing this, I could actually come up with a new way to implement that formula that's faster. So that's one way of thinking of it. Or, you know, I don't know the best way for 10 robots to clean an area. So it might be, so it's interesting with a lot of, again, my colleagues in, in uh, evolution of robotics, for excavation problems, when they load in like 10 robots into a, you know, a, an area with a bunch of dirt that they need to dig through, and then they just let the thing evolve, under many conditions, nine robots go and they sit next to the door and get out of the way for the one robot to do the excavation, because under tight scenarios, the other robots just get in the way of everyone else. I wouldn't have necessarily anticipated that. It makes sense in retrospect, but I would have gone into it and tried to have all the robots help each other in some particular way, but the evolutionary algorithm found a different way to program that. Yeah. So the, the way you're making sure that every child or, or new generation is syntactically correct is because of the type. That's right. So you're, you're never going to generate code that doesn't work. That's right. It might not be functionally right, but it'll be syntactically every time. That's right. But then how do you generate your initial population? You can randomly, I mean, you just randomly generate uh, trees. So, and you just have to set some constraint, like I want my trees to be so tall, or so fast, or use so many whatevers. But yeah, you can just randomly generate operations, and then you generate things that can happen at the leaves of those operations, and the leaves of those, and the leaves of those. And as long as everything's closed, then you've got a random set of code. You execute it, it might do some funny things. Yeah. Uh, as you said, like we're gonna swap things. Like, what what are we gonna swap? We're gonna swap one branch with another one. That's right. You're gonna swap this whole cloud with that whole cloud. You swap them, and that's how you do crossover. So, as uh, to make this more concrete, so that's crossover. For example, on the left, I might have two x plus three point one four, and on the right, I might have x times the cosine of four point five. Um, but then if I do this crossover operation, um, then I might end up getting 4.5 plus 3.14 and x times the cosine of 2x, in which case I've taken the 4.5 and the 2x and I have swapped them so that the 2x went there and the 4.5 went there. And so this is you know, abstractly what I'm depicting could happen concretely here. And so that is a way to evolve programs the same way we evolve solutions to optimization problems. And this is taken to the extreme. So if you look up um, platforms like Avita, for example, there's a guy named Charles Ofria at MSU. And he's gotten a lot of publicity for Avita. You can download Avita. Um, there's educational versions of Avita, where he's taken this to the extreme where he actually creates digital organisms that live in an ecosystem inside a computer that are fighting for um, basically fitness, true fitness. So they actually try to increase their representation in the next generation by co-opting the other organisms in the, in the ecosystem to maximize um, their level of duplication. So these evolved viruses, for example, that get rid, because you know what's a great way to maximize your footprint in numbers? It's to be as small of, of an individual footprint as possible. And so if you can find another piece of code that will take you as an input and spit you out as an output, like a virus does, then you can actually get more representation. You just need a certain number of those copiers to stay in the environment. And so he's naturally had these things. So he uses this digital evolution framework to study patterns that could occur in real evolutionary uh, systems. But there is no like fitness function in terms of like useful thing that it's doing. But he's taken genetic programming and just turned it in a way to generate things that actually move around in an environment and interact with each other. So that's kind of the, the, like I said, the very extreme case of genetic programming. But there are, I claim, uh, potential uses for these things that, you know, let's say you're trying to come up with, again, we mentioned diagnostics for cybersecurity. You don't know the best way to tell that you're being attacked. And it might involve probing your own system in certain ways to see if you get certain responses back. And you don't know the ways in which to, to best probe your system. Well, you can encode them in programming and then let this thing evolve different diagnostic routines and see which diagnostic routines are better at detecting that you've had an intrusion. So that's another way of doing it. 
or just a general alternative to artificial neural networks where instead of changing weights on edges, you're actually changing uh, functions, the, the way they link into each other. Yeah. Well, I mean, the offspring cannot be functional, in which case it'll just get selected out. So it's just like if you're close to a, a peak in your optimization objective in a genetic algorithm, uh, and your offspring is way far away so that it's you know, terrible, then it just won't be selected in a way that it'll get you know, selected out. Same thing here. If this, was, if this program does a pretty good job you know, implementing whatever you wanted to implement, and you swap in this, that offspring, if it's low in fitness, just won't get picked, and you'll stick with the parent instead. Any other questions about those? So I mentioned the spirit of this. I've shown you that you can have two different types of representations at least. The finite state machines, um, the syntax trees, you could, um, I was claiming that there's other ways to encode, to find ways to represent code so that um, you can get a lot of expressiveness without ever actually having to create blocks of code. Sort of atomized code um, but um, and you know there's interesting things that come up from this like um, for example you can what people who do this do find out that sometimes it'll create junk code so biologists would call these introns so there's uh, things these introns are, are sequences that are in between coding sequences so they don't they don't actually code for anything but they end up being junk DNA in between things that do code for things. Well, it turns out that sometimes by adding junk code, so you know, there'll be branches here that will like be started with wild false. And like underneath it, there'll be a whole bunch of code that never gets executed because at the root of that branch is a big old it false or wild false. Now, it turns out that they end up actually converging much faster than, than kind of cleaned up code that doesn't have. And that might be because they're more evolvable, because they can kind of store innovations in this like hidden little section inside the genotype that doesn't actually get to be used, but periodically can cross over and end up being used in others. So there's a lot of weird things that comes out of this. The fact that, you know, and, that, and, and it's kind of interesting that just like in biology, we don't know what the introns are for. But here, it kind of allows us to take a computer science perspective to sort of say, what could, good could introns do in terms of these things? Well, maybe they store innovation that we don't need now, but we might need later. So, um, so that's kind of interesting. The other further applications is people have been working on this in terms of circuit design. And with FPGAs, there's a lot of um, interesting things that you can do. So field programmable gate arrays are pieces of hardware that can rewire themselves, as they say, in the field. And so um, those field programmable gate, gate arrays can, um, you can basically think of them as, as grids of wires on top of other wires where you decide if two wires that are overlapping actually touch. And you can programmatically say whether they touch or not. And it turns out that the way in which you wire these things up together, decide who's, who's touching and who's not, allows you to implement any uh, piece of logic that you would like. And so in principle, you could deploy a piece of code and have it improve itself over time or gain new function over time. And so this is a way to actually have kind of deploy new versions of code without any programmers being available. It sort of naturally will adapt. So that's another thing that people are kind of um, you know, playing with. And then for those of you in bioinformatics, um, these look like uh, biomedical decision trees, diagnostic trees. So you can think of this as saying patient presents with blotchy skin and uh, dizziness. Well, that, you know, in that case, you then go down one diagnostic path. Well, let's try um, you know, this drug, this medical test. If those tests come back in a particular way, then we'll get, you know, that rules out certain things and takes us the other way. So people are using genetic programming to evolve new diagnostic trees for medicine. So that's another way. So you don't have to just think of them as programs. You can think of them as generic decision trees. And you could probably come up with ways in which you can think about making the, you know, a better random forest using these evolutionary approaches, for example. So they're just ways in which 
that genetic algorithms have kind of enhanced the way people think about maybe for good, maybe for bad, but at least shows you that people started with these, you know, the simple GAs and evolutionary strategies, and over time they found new ways to insert them into a wide range of application areas, and um, and now you find them as just alternatives, ways to automate innovation and automate creativity, again for better and for worse. But it's good to kind of know that those are out there. Um, so. That's kind of the end of my beyond the genetic uh, algorithms spiel. The next step in this will be in multi-objective optimization where we go back to more conventional applications of the genetic algorithm and we talk about what happens when you have multiple fitness objectives simultaneously. So any questions about this? This is my stray into this. I'm not gonna ask you to write any code about these things, but I probably will put up a short um, concept check where I ask sort of a couple of questions about um, you know, just checking uh, or getting you to kind of rethink over this material. But again, I'm not going to make you write like a genetic program. But this would be great. I have had people do really nice final projects where they do genetic programs in their final projects. So do like stock investment, for example, things like that. So. All right, well, that's all I've got for you today. Thank you.